Hello, folks. This is Jordan Maxwell back again. And uh, I thought that was an appropriate introduction to the subject matter and the person we're talking with this hour. Her name is Nancy. And uh, many people will already know Nancy because I did a show with Nancy uh, quite a few years ago. And it got such an incredible response from, from really around the world. I got so many emails and people saying, oh, who is this interesting uh, lady and let's get her back on. And so, so I came across her number and I called her and happily I'm still connected to Nancy and what a sweetheart she is. And she's been a dear friend of mine for many years. But the reason why I love talking with Nancy is she's fascinating on all kinds of interesting things, which, uh, which most people are not even aware of. So we've had some interesting times together and talked about some extraordinary stuff together. And so I thought I would love to bring Nancy back on tonight and kind of reminisce over old times and some of the things we talked about in our last conversation. That was years ago. So I hope she's with us. Nancy, are you with me now? Yeah, I'm here, Jordan. Well, there you are. <laughs> How are you doing, sweetie? Oh, fine. And uh, I'm happy to know that you're here now with me because, uh, you know, we had such an incredible time uh, and a show you know, that we did. I was amazed, as I said, I was amazed at the response that people got from that last time. Maybe we could... Maybe we could go over some of that for the new audience about your background, your life, and tell us a little bit about when you were growing up and you know, your family and whatever you could tell us about your, your father and his work or whatever. Because I think people would need to know that before we go any further. Well, I know you have a lot of that information available uh, or did have. I don't know. Maybe you don't have it available anymore. Um but my, uh, well, I was born into a military family, and um, my dad was, he was kind of a John Wayne sort of person, you know. He's uh, totally all American, all military. Uh, there was nothing the military could do that was wrong in my father's eyes, and uh, my mother was European. And uh, my mo my dad saved my mother's life, actually, and helped to um, save her entire family after the war in Europe. She had been in a concentration camp for three years when she was in her mid-teens. And when she got out, she was very, very ill, as you may well imagine. And he had been working for the, at that time he was working for the constabulary when he met her. But um, my dad was just one of these people that somehow got into uh, an area of study and activity with the military that few people back then were aware of, and that's UFOs. And... Um, I remember I, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of opportunity to talk to my father about just about anything regarding his life. He was 35 years older than my mother when he married her, and he was in his 50s when I was born. And almost all of his family was departed at that time, so I had few opportunities to try to get to know him or his family, you know. And back then in the 50s, kids were a lot different than they are now. They weren't as, um, uh, might I say, savvy, you know, worldly-wise as kids are today because of the um, the access to media and, you know, world information. We were very um, sheltered. I was. I was extremely sheltered. Of course, living a military life, I was out in the middle of nowhere most of the time. And this was back in the UFO uh, diamond that uh, consisted of the eastern eastern Colorado, southern Utah, northern Texas, um, 
you know, western Colorado, eastern Nevada, all of Arizona, and all of New Mexico, and this was back in the 50s. So between 1950 and 1960, when we were living in these territories, um, my dad used to be shuttled around a lot, um, small jaunts, you know, lasting two, two, three weeks. He had this special telephone. It was red. And uh, when that telephone rang, we got up and we got moving. And, you know, most of the time we left everything behind us. I had no brothers and sisters. So um, it was kind of an isolated life because back in the 50s, there was not a lot out there. Even in Las Vegas where we lived for four years, uh, there was very little, you know, even on the Strip. There weren't that many casinos there. Pretty pretty well developed downtown, but uh, not too much on the Strip yet. So the first time I remember my father talking about having seen um, a craft that we would call a UFO um, was he, he said he was off the coast of Greenland on a ship and the entire ship's company was there. It was the beginning of the day when people were getting their duty rosters and things and being told what was going to happen for the day. And um, the entire company saw activity out in the water beyond them and a light coming up, growing larger and larger and larger. And then as the light got to the surface, it was, he said it was enormous, just an enormous craft of some type, um, circular in dimension. And it just sped out of the water at an angle and took off into the sky and did a couple of quick maneuvers, um, relatively high up. And he said the entire ship's company, having seen that, all of the officers were scurrying around trying to um, put a lid on it, you know, um, yeah. debriefing everybody that nobody could talk about it. I don't know um, if the military had any um, idea of what that was at that time, because like I said, that was back in the 30s. But my, that started my father's interest in um, UFOs, and he was just stupefied by it. And I, I don't even know what branch of the service he was in at that time. He was how he got to be on a ship, a military ship off Greenland, is still a little bit of a, um, a conundrum for me uh, because my dad started out. Uh, in, in the scouts, the cavalry scouts, he was, um, part Indian. And then from the scouts, he went into the regular cavalry and was in the cavalry. Let's see, that was back, um, the scout part was in the late teens, I guess, of the early, early century. And then, uh, by the twenties, he was in regular cavalry. And um, possibly even a little bit earlier than that. And then he moved through many different services, um, the Army Air Corps, the Air Corps, the Army, um, the uh, Coast Artillery. And it, it was always just such a strange thing for me to to find out that he was in so many different um, branches of the service and he, and that he would be in the places that he was when I started looking into it. Um, when my father actually told me about um, having been at a crash site for the military, I was five years old. And um, he came into the house one evening very, very, very early in the morning. And it seems like a lot of things in my life happen right around 2 o'clock in the morning. I don't know why it's the weirdest thing. I can't explain it, but it seems to happen that way. And um, so he came 
into my bedroom and he picked me out of bed and said he had something to tell me and he sat me on a couch with my mother in the living room and proceeded to tell me about um, this spacecraft that he had just uh, gone to see and that he wanted me to know that that there there was life forms on it that were not us and that people were going to tell me through the years, you know, that there were no such things, but he wanted me to, to know that they were in fact true. And um, told me the, the one thing that he really impressed upon me at the time was that I'm, I mustn't tell anyone about it as a, as a little kid because people wouldn't understand it would cause a worldwide panic. And so, you know, I just kind of froze up on all of that information. But as I went along, and he really never talked to me so much about anything concerning that. But every now and again, I would hear him and my mom talk about things when they thought I was asleep. And um, so consequently... I don't know why I didn't have more curiosity about it as a kid, you know, to actually go up and really question him about it. I, I guess I was just too too young to think about it. But it created in me a, an intense uh, curiosity about anything that had to do with um, space or science fiction or um they, they called them creatures back then, they, you know, aliens, whatever we call them now, extraterrestrials. And um, so consequently, my mom and I were dragged wherever he went. Uh, not all the time, but a goodly portion of the time. And uh, the rest of the time we were left and he would be gone for quite a while and then come back from another sighting. And then every now and again, when we would go on these trips, he would point the lights out in the sky, and, and we could actually see them in the in the deserts that we were going through every now and again. And uh, he, he'd point at some of these um, clusters of lights that were going in very, very odd configurations, zigzags, or very quickly across the night sky. And he'd said, that's what I'm going to see, Nancy. That's what I'm going to see. And um, one time, I didn't know until many, many years later when I went out to Nevada again to um, kind of retrace some of the steps that my father had took me on on little night excursions. Uh, one of them led straight out to um, the area, Area 51, beyond uh, Las Vegas. And I was I was there with my late fiance, and I was I was just going, my God, you know, it was Area 51 that he was always taking me over to, not to the interior of it, but you know, the out the um, surrounding areas late at night and seeing things out there. So I, you know, my dad initially was um, God, what was the name of the place? Fort Bliss, Texas. He was. He did much of his initial um, surveying from that point. That was his home base. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I don't know enough about those places even now. I keep wanting to go and find out more about them, but I just happen to have time over the years. You know, you life gets in the way sometimes. Yeah. No doubt about that. And uh, you and I have had some interesting experiences. And uh, I, I've had my own really uh, tremendous experiences in Area 51 with, uh, with an actual alien coming in uh, the, the motel where we were. So that's a whole story in itself. But that's why I am totally convinced that there is extraterrestrial life and extraterrestrial technology going on in Area 51 because I've seen it with my own eyes. Oh, and, yeah. You know, so I know there's something otherworldly going on out there, legitimately speaking. You know, 
Yeah, well, I don't, I don't know about the, um, the alien issue for Area 51. Other people would know that. Um, but I do know that the bases in New Mexico and Arizona definitely had aliens. Um, and, uh, well, you know, I, I've told you before my own experiences with several alien encounters. As yeah, I did. wanted you to get in, and I wanted you to tell some of the, uh, tell us uh, the, some of those experiences uh, because they're fascinating to me and to the audience. If you could recall, uh, well, the first one I was a very little girl. This was even before Daddy told me that these creatures really did exist. I don't even know if he really understood when I saw what I saw, what it was. Because uh, we spent so much time out in the um, in the desert, you know, he had this Geiger counter, and he was always using this Geiger counter, look, looking for radiation and um, exploring caves and just doing all all kinds of things. Now, my dad was his cover for what he was doing was a bandsman, and yet, you know, he had all kinds of uh, expertise in mineralogy and um, engineering and all kinds of other things. I mean, he was just a, a really amazing man with many, many, many skills. And um, and and everywhere he went, uh, well, one of the things that, that he did, I know that uh, in 19, was it 1946, uh, he was sent from Fort Bliss to um, to Sweden. You remember the Foo Fighters? Mm-hmm, yes. It, yeah, it was, I believe it was in 1946. Don't quote me on that. I'm pretty sure, but not that sure. I haven't looked at my notes, you know, for all of this stuff in a long time. But um, at any rate, he was sent to Sweden to investigate the Foo Fighters, and my mother went with him um, a little bit later on another excursion to do the same thing. Um, And evidently, apparently, from some of the information I have, he requested that he go over there to do that. But um, at any rate, when I was little, I had this um, encounter with a a gray, a, a small gray, and it was no bigger than I was uh, at the time. And it came out of a, a cave, one of the one of the caves that we were around. And I don't know where my mom, I don't remember at all where my mom and dad were, but they had to have been around somewhere. And I called him I called him Lollipot because he looked like a lollipop. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he had a big head and this really long, thin body. And uh, I saw him a couple of times. One time he actually came, and I'm saying a he, I don't know why, but it just seems right. Um, he came one time into my room when we were uh, living uh, in a, a, a rental unit before we had to move on to something else. And I remember having a little, a little Coke tea party with him. He, I just put it in front of him. He didn't really taste it or anything, but um, my mom saw me through the keyhole of the door because they had keyholes back then, and she heard me talking to someone. And then uh, she had she had told my dad, and I'm not sure what my dad did after that uh, in in regards to lollipop, but we had hit one of the same kind of creature uh, with the car out in the desert one evening. And my dad got out, and I remember um, I had been asleep until we hit hit it. I felt the bump and woke up, and my dad took the creature and put it in the back of the car and then took it on to another facility, leaving my mother and myself um, back at a motel that we were staying at. And I'm I'm always assuming at this point that that was 
one of it was still alive when it was in the back of the car it wasn't it wasn't dead so I kind of shudder to think what might have happened to it um, if it went to the military and I'm pretty sure it did because that's what my dad did but uh, the, the one that was really most dynamic for me was of course the reptilian that was in my room when I was um, between 10 and 11 years old. That yeah, was about that. Um, it was one of the only times that my mother and father ever left me alone. My father was very protective of me and didn't like leaving me lo- alone at all. And my understanding was one of the reasons why was that they were finding um, hybrid children on some of the crash sites. And he was always afraid something might happen to me because of what he did. So they didn't leave me alone very much, even though by the time I was 10, 11 years old, I was, I was not a scaredy cat kid. You know, I, I loved monster movies and sci-fi, science fiction and, um, I wasn't afraid of the dark. I was just a real responsible kid. I'd been, babysitting from the time I was seven years old, other people's children, and I was just a real responsible, um, more adult child because I was always around adults. I wasn't around kids. So uh, that particular day, my mom and dad wanted to go see my aunt, and I asked them if I could please stay home by myself because I really didn't want to go, and they said, yeah. So I was there in my room listening to Claire de Lune on the record player. And there was a door at the foot of my bed and a window to the left of me behind my record player. And we were in a two-story apartment complex. So there was no way out of the room. If I would have tried to jump out of the window, I would have splattered on the concrete below. So... uh Anyway, the um, the evening was going by relatively nicely as I was just listening to the beautiful music that I love, and then I became slowly aware of a clicking sound in in the room, and uh, there was a little bit of moonshine coming through the window that kind of angled down toward the bottom of my bed, but the rest of the room was in darkness, and I. At first, I just kind of noted the clicking, and then I kind of perked up because it got louder and louder, and it was more like staticky at one point, uh, a staticky quality to it, but still a, a lot of clicking in it. And so I looked to the foot of my bed where the sound was coming from, and I thought maybe I'd left a radio or something on, you know, we had those little transistor radios back then in my in my closet. And I thought, no, I didn't do that. I could see it over on my on my little dresser. And pretty soon the the static clicking got really, really intense. And then as I was looking at the closet and the closet door was open. I saw a figure. It was just a a darker darkness than the darkness around it. And um, I'm going, oh, my God, there's something in or someone in my closet. And uh, the clicking stopped. And I kind of jumped up in my bed with my feet back behind me and just ready to spring to try to to move if I thought there was actually somebody there. And something stooped out of the closet and then stood up. And it was it was taller than the closet um, door frame was mm-hmm. and just really dark. I couldn't see what it was. But it had humanoid dimensions, and I was just freaking out at that point just trying to think, what can I do? What can I do? Uh, where can I go? I, I was thinking, can I get out the window? No, I can't get out the window. I, 
I had reached over very gradually and I turned off the record player so I could concentrate on what I was seeing. And the door to my room was closed and it was at the foot of my bed where the door was. So I just, for a, for for that age, I got very, very focused and just really intent on what was happening. And um, slowly, very slowly, and this was so slowly that it was, you know, I've, I've said it before, it seemed like um, a, a very predatory thing, you know, how you see a cat kind of sneaking up on a mouse. Yeah. The movement is so slow, it's insidious. All of a sudden, you realize that whatever it is, it's a little bit closer and then a little bit closer. And it petrifies you. It, it, it stupefies you, petrifies you, and almost hypnotizes you. And um, so I was watching this darkness come over to the side of my bed, still at the foot, but very slowly moving over. And then it got slightly into the light, and when it did, it made a really quick kind of lurching, squatting kind of movement where it thrust its hands out on both sides like it was, you know, getting ready to catch me. Uh, but but it, it, a movement that was definitely um, to make sure that I couldn't get by in some way. And... Um, that freaked me out, just absolutely freaked me out because not only at, when it did that could I, could I, I started to see some of what it was and its hand was in a portion of the light and I could see that it wasn't a human hand, it was a reptile hand and I could see a portion of the face and to me at the time I I wasn't thinking what reptiles really look like. Uh, it, it seemed to me that it had teeth. Um, on later reflection, many years later, when I was trying to reconstruct it in my mind and try to figure out if, if it really had teeth or if it just had those serrations like reptiles have on their mouth. <coughs> yeah. Um, but it looked enough like teeth to me at that moment in time that I didn't want to have anything to do with it. And I lunged. I lunged with all of my might to the bottom of the bed, past its hand, just past its hand. And the bedclothes were going everywhere. I, I raced out of the bedroom. And and I thought if I went down the the corridor, it would get me. So I went around the, the side door to the bathroom and I locked the door and I went and hid behind the toilet. And um, I just stayed there and everything was very quiet. And the thing didn't make any noise. It made no noise at all in terms of I couldn't hear it breathing. It wasn't making any um, vocalizations of any kind, but it got to the door. I could hear it come out of the bedroom and stand in front of the door. And it took its hands or something, and I wasn't sure which, up to the top of the door and then scraped it all the way down to the bottom several times. It was like something um, scratching across a, a chalkboard, only worse. And uh, I was just petrified at that point. I, I thought I was toast because, you know, it could get into the bathroom if it, if it wanted to. It was certainly big enough to knock down the door. And then a few moments later, I heard the key in the front door. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, my mom and dad, my mom and dad. And the, the scraping stopped. And then I heard the door open and I heard my dad call out my name and I was too petrified to respond. And I didn't, you know, I, by that time I had seen a number of science fiction movies and I thought, oh my God, what if it can throw its voice? You know, maybe it's not really my dad. But then I heard my mother's voice and um, I finally, you know, after, after, 
hearing them say a few words and then getting frantic and screaming Nancy, Nancy and running down the hallway because they could see what I couldn't see, which is the side of the door that it had been scratching. And uh, so I finally came out of the bathroom. I opened the door and that's when I saw the curls of wood that had just been gouged out of the door because they were um, solid core doors back then. They didn't I don't think, I don't think they had the hollow doors that they've had, you know, in recent years. But um, my father was freaking out, just freaking out. And I told him what happened and he said, that's it. I'm done. I'm never doing another thing. My family is now in danger. And um, we packed up and left immediately. And so I don't really know if my father had any more to do with, um, I'm kind of thinking not, you know, with with his uh, former functions in the military because, uh, but he was always going to the military still, even so, um, even after that, that was... Uh, by 1961, we were living down in San Diego, and he would go to the naval base down there all the time and be gone for for quite a long time. And then, of course, my dad, you know, a little while later, he um, he got sick, and he had warned my mother and um, not me, but my mother, but I heard, I overheard the conversation that night. This was back when we were living in Las Vegas. He had told my mother that if he ever got sick, to never leave him alone, that he was afraid what would happen, that he knew too much. And um, so he, he gave her a scenario, and it was either he would be reinducted back into... Uh, the military if he had tried to get out because he was thinking of retiring many, many, many times. And then if they didn't do that, then he might, that something worse might happen to him. And um, so he did, in fact, get um, ill in 1964 and went into a military hospital and a couple of weeks later, we were told that he had died, even though we had both both just seen him alive. Um, he had gone in for surgery for a stomach ulcer, and um, my mother had stayed by his side for the entire several weeks that he was there. I didn't go home for anything. And she was getting really, really tired. But, um, you know, she's very dutiful, very dutiful person and, you know, trying to do her best for my dad, who she adored. And once we were told that he had passed away, uh, the way it happened was just weird. You know, it's, I saw my dad in, in the, the, they had taken him down to the ICU, and I had talked to him just maybe 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes before this happened. And the next thing we know, you know, my mom, my dad wanted to talk to my mom. She left looking for a doctor, and then she came by, back and said she couldn't find one. And then all of a sudden, there was all this activity and they threw a curtain around my dad and then a young doctor came out to us and told us that my dad had passed and my mom wanted to see him you know one last time of course and they wouldn't let her in they said it was against military regulations so my mother, of course, freaked to try to get other people to let her in. Nobody would let her in to see him. And then so she made the plan that she was going to see him in the morgue. 
And so we waited around for several hours to make sure they had enough time to take them down to the morgue and went down there. And um, she goes, it was always almost like one of those horror movies, you know. It was, it was not, uh, it was a very kind of a, an empty space down there where they were. And there was just this one light shining into a hallway where the where the morgue was. And uh, the door was open and there was a desk on the inside of the door with a man who was writing in a journal of some sort. And my mother walked up to him, and he didn't raise his eyes. She said, yeah, she'd like to see her husband. Then he asked for the name, the name. And all of a sudden, he looks up at her and snaps to attention. And, and so, so I'm sorry. Um, it's against military regulations. You can't see your husband. And she's wondering, well, why? You know, he has... He hasn't been blown apart. There's nothing wrong with his body that I shouldn't be able to see him if I want to. And he just kept repeating that line over and over that she couldn't see him. It was against military regulation. So we ended up leaving very frustrated, and I was just in shock. I didn't know what the heck was going on. And uh, I was 14 by that time. And my... Uh, Mom goes home and, and calls up a mortuary and makes arrangements for burial. So she decides she wants to have a an open casket viewing. And they said, okay, no problem. We'll have the open casket viewing. A couple of days later, we, we go to find that the casket has been sealed and the mortician, not the mortician, but the um, the clerk that is there, uh, presiding over the activities is telling us that it's against military regulations. And I don't even know if that facility was a military facility or not, but once again, we were prevented from seeing my father's body. And then uh, we went through the ceremony, of course, the burial ceremony. And, after, and there were tons of people there. Oh, my God, I couldn't believe it. High, high, high-ranking officers and generals and just... And we hadn't told anybody about his passing except a couple of our relatives. So we were just standing with all these people around, and they're all telling us how sorry they were of the passing of my father and my mom's husband. And I, we were both pretty much in shock at that point. We just didn't understand any of it at all. And then they all left, and my mother was left with me there at the burial site. And I was looking out to sea, and my mother was looking where the, the grave was when I noticed this uh, custodian, groundskeeper, um, kind of dragging his rake along the ground and I just looked back out to see, and then the next time I looked over, he was a little bit closer, and he had stopped raking, and he was looking around. And then he started sidling over again a little bit closer, and by that time it seemed like kind of odd behavior, and um, so I kept watching him. And he kept stopping every now and again, and he got closer and closer. Finally, he was about within six feet or so of my mom, and I was just standing there watching him, and he he starts going, tss, tss, don't turn around, don't turn around, um, just listen. And so he, he goes, is that supposed to be your husband in there? And my mom went, yeah, and he goes, well, I've got news for you, lady. There's no body in that casket. And with that, he took off like a shot. He was gone. And, uh, of course, by that time, my mom and I were both pretty convinced that my father hadn't, in fact, died and that he had been somehow re, um, recalled into duty. But, you know, we didn't know for sure. We certainly didn't want to believe that, you know, anything worse had happened to him. So for the next couple of 
weeks we were, my mother tried to get information from, you know, people like Cranston and this was Senator Cranston at that time and, and some other higher officials trying to find out what had happened and uh, she got a couple of calls that said that she had better back off and stop asking questions and um, so she did. She stopped. She got scared and decided that she would just leave well enough alone and um, then a, about a week or so after that happened I was standing out in my front yard um, in Ocean Beach and I noticed this kind of shadowy figure across the street under a tree and I looked over fast enough to be able to see that whoever it was, even though they were in shadow, they were dressed exactly the way my father would dress, you know, with the Stetson, a fedora, and um, and the same kind of body build. Um, I couldn't see his face, but as soon as he noticed that I was watching him, he took off down the, the street and he walked exactly like my dad and I raced into the house immediately to go to get my mom. And she came running out, and she just got a glimpse of him going around the corner. So because of that incident and, and one other where the same man showed up far far down the street, but just standing up against a, a lamp post kind of thing um, and watching me. The same thing, you know, he was too, I have, I'm pretty nearsighted, so I couldn't see a lot of detail. But, you know, there are things that are pretty distinctive about people, and certainly my father's walk was one of those distinctive things about him. It was kind of one of those swaggers, kind of a John Wayne, uh, Robert Mitchum kind of a walk. And uh, it's hard hard to dismiss, you know, as uh, as not being him. So... At least my mother and, and I decided that he must have um, just been recalled. The only problem with that, I mean, it's it's rough on the family, you know. It was very, very hard having my father taken away from us like that. Of course. I We always hoped that it was for good reasons, you know, and um, we both love America and, you know, although you don't always agree with your governments and everything they do, just like you don't agree with your neighbors with everything they do, um, it's such a wonderful place. You know, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else in the world than America. And, um, and I was raised to love America. That was my dad's big thing, you know? So, um, but it's hard. It's really hard. It, it was it was a hard life because of the isolation. It was uh, difficult losing my dad so young. I know I um I always had a really hard time with that. Of course, and I understand that. And uh, there are many other stories rather similar. Other people have experienced the same type of thing, you know, different to, to different degrees and for different reasons. <clears throat> <clears throat> but I'm I'm very interested in the idea that there is uh, a world of knowledge that we are not being told, that we're not being given. Uh, and and I talk with, I've talked with so many people in military and in, in Hollywood and motion pictures that are saying the same thing. You know, there's a world out there of things going on. I guess you would put it into metaphysical, <clears throat> spiritual things happening which has a extraterrestrial uh, connection somehow. So I've always been aware of that. There's, even when I was a child, I had extraterrestrial experiences. <clears throat> so that's always, you know, I grew up with that. And so that's why when I was talking with you, I always I was always in tune with what you were saying because it, I've had similar things happen to me. Well, what you else? know, and it you makes know. it really hard growing up for people who have had experiences that are so out of the ordinary, like you and I have. 
and like others have that, you know, have been reporting through the years and some some people listen, some people don't. It doesn't matter, you know, whether they do or not. The information is for those who need it, who want well, it. Well, that's right. That's you right. know, and the others, well, maybe it plants a seed that will grow at some point in the future. But, um, you know, I had, my mother had all these psychic abilities. You know, she was a sensitive and here's my father with uh, all of these uh, extraterrestrial things that are happening. So I was kind of um, hyper exposed to the more odd uh, things of life, you know. So I guess I was more open to it. And in some ways, it's, it's I've noted that it's kind of like when you own a Jeep, all of a sudden you're aware of everybody else who owns a Jeep. Mm -hmm. where you never would have noticed them before, you know, except maybe in passing once in a while. Um, But when you have been inundated like this, you know, you are. You're just more open to to having experiences, unless, of course, they scare you. Now, the only one that actually scared me was the reptilian. That, That one scared the living heck out of me. But as I got older, I started thinking about it, and I realized that if this extraterrestrial or intraterrestrial, if you want to go by some of what the um, Native Americans used to talk about with having the reptiles under Los Angeles and everything, because this stuff happened in Gardena, which was down in L.A. County, and, um, you know, we're back in the 60s where I had that incident. Then, um, regardless of whether you consider it extraterrestrial or intraterrestrial, um, those kinds of experiences kind of set you up if they're not traumatizing. If they are, then, you know, you might back away and go, oh, well, you, you know, you run and you get into other things. You, you, go into your religion more or you go into science more and try to, you know, debunk what it is. That didn't happen with me. I was such a curious kid that rather than being hyper-traumatized by that one experience, um, I got curious and I wanted to know more. And um, I continued to be curious. You know, I've been curious all my life about various things. You know, you you mentioned something just in passing that I think is equally as interesting and important uh, because I've talked with other people about this and I've got a couple of friends that are really uh, really on on this subject and that is the the extraterrestrial presence under underground, under earth And, and I've talked about my experiences with my girlfriend's father who used to take me out to Palmdale way out. I mean, that's back in 59. Go out to Palmdale when there's almost nothing out there and, and talk about the different ex- extraterrestrials who were underground, uh, underground uh, caverns, etc. But also, uh, there's there's been newspaper clippings and articles about uh, a reptile alien presence under Los Angeles. We talked about that once before. Do you recall any of the any uh, any of the information on that about reptilian presence under Los Angeles? Oh yeah, I mean I've I've had a, heard a lot of different things about it. I mean some say that you know there's uh, caverns and things under the the library downtown Los Angeles, and there's some mansion somewhere that supposedly has a bunch of them underneath. But uh, the thing that was more interesting to me is I lived in. Um, Highland Park for a while, and the San Gabrielo Indians um, have a you know a huge presence in that area, and they have mythologies that go back you know hundreds of years, if not more, about reptiles living underground in that area. So um, mm-hmm. you know it's it's not unfeasible to me to consider the fact that you know that is a possibility. Distinct possibility for where some of these um, 
entities either habitate or um, or or go to in in order to try to escape detection, you know, one or the other. They either come from there or they go there. And like I said, the one little gray that I was involved with when I was a little girl came up out of a, a cavern. So, um, yeah, you know, it's it's a potential. Uh, I, I remember so. years ago that was, what was it, uh, Admiral, was it Admiral Byrd? Mm-hmm. Uh, who went to the North Pole or someplace like that, who said that he yeah. found uh, cities underground? Yeah, now I've often wondered about that. It was at, I think it's Antarctica, the South Pole, but, but, uh, One yeah, yeah, and I don't recall, you know, I, I've, I've heard him, but, uh, that's strange that, uh, because he was an admiral and he did go down there. And he well, did and come what back, a strange, you know. and what a strange thing for somebody who was an explorer that like that to come back with a tale of, you know, yeah. very odd. Um, you know, it's just like within the last few years, I um, I made kind of a connection with the fact that my dad knew Admiral um, was it Admiral Twining, no, uh, made Major or Colonel Twining. Oh yeah, the, the guy who Twining. was in with Majestic Twelve. That's right. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so I've been trying to piece these little things together. It, you know, it's a big jigsaw puzzle, the information oh, that I have. Even when I went to get um, through the Freedom of Information Act uh, information from the uh, the Veterans Administration, I cut all of this stuff back that was all blacked out. Just, <laughs> you know, for a bandsman, that doesn't make any sense at all. You know, what yeah. would a bandsman be doing that would require that kind of deletion of information? But uh, that was the one, that was one of the places that I got confirmation on the red phone. It was stuck to the back of one of the pages. And I thought, wow, did somebody put it there on purpose, you know, for me to find? Or was that a mistake somehow? It's just interesting that it should turn up in that particular way because the the page that was preceding it that it was stuck to um was not anything in particular you know yeah and what was it that you found it was a a, a request for a special telephone to be oh, yeah, uh, yeah. put into our residence and like yeah. i said we had them you know wherever we went and that was that was the phone that my dad would uh jump to yeah and we weren't allowed to touch it <laughs> and we're still not allowed to touch anything today <laughs> we're gonna have to go and i really appreciate you coming on with me nancy and we'll have to talk later and uh but fascinating stuff with a brilliant and fascinating lady and a long time friend of mine and thank you nancy for being with me 